the, the second lecture we're going to do on parallel joint algorithms. Uh, as I said, there's the, the, the two main algorithms are sort merge versus hash join. So hash join was last class. Today we're going to do sorting. Um, just real quick for project two, so there's a bunch of stuff happening next week on Monday. So this week has is, is, is been the status meetings. I've met with some of you guys today, meeting with people on Tuesday and Wednesday. And this is, this is a precursor coming up for uh, sort of the, the first major checkpoint on Monday next week. So there'll be three things you have to do. The first is that in class, we'll do an update presentation, basically describing what the status is of your, of your project, and what are, the, you know, what, are the, what are the major challenges or issues that you faced, what has changed in what you're proposing to do. Again, the, the website will lay out exactly what's expected. And then you'll have to turn in two things. You, uh, you'll do a code review submission, which basically is that you send a pull request to the master branch on, on GitHub for our repo, and then I will assign a, another group in the class to then do re review your, your code. And everyone has to provide feedback and comments about you know, the quality of the code or what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. But then this year we're doing something different where you also have to turn in a design document, which is basically a, uh, there's a template file we provide for you that says, it's you writing in English a description of what your, uh, what your, what your PR looks like, what, what your implementation actually does. And again, there'll be documentation on the website that says how to do this. So what I'll do for the code review submissions, I'll, I'll, I'll go over what's expected for the code review on Wednesday in class. But the basic idea is that you'll list your PR uh, on, on, the, on the spreadsheet, on the Google Doc for the class, and then I'll sign another group to, 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 to look at it, and you'll look at theirs. And you're going to do this twice. You do this now as a checkpoint, and then you'll do this again with, with, you know, with the same team pairings at the end of the semester. So, you actually, so you're not looking at brand new code each time. You're looking at the same, uh, the, the, the same project from the other group. And again, the idea is that it's just providing you feedback to say you know, what you're doing stupid or what, what some other things you maybe not thought about. Right? And you're supposed to take these suggestions and actually make your code better. And this is super useful because like, how often do you actually look at other people's code in, in, in you know, in classes in university, almost never, right? Because you're not supposed to, because that's cheating. So this is like this is a way to sort of see how people do other people do things. So, okay. So any questions about any of this? Okay, cool. All right. So as I said, the uh, our focus here today is on uh, parallel joint algorithms. And again, the 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 big distinction between the introduction course and this class is that in the introduction course we never talked about how we're actually going going to execute the join in terms of the, the low-level operations that we're, that we're doing on the CPUs, where the data is actually being stored. It was all about you know, reading and reading, writing blocks from disk. And then the two main approaches that, uh, that you, you care about in, in, a, in a fast database system is doing the hash join and the server join. And as I said, we don't really care about nested loop joins. We need to have them for some workloads, but they're primarily for, for OLTB things. So for today's agenda, we're going to do a little bit of background information on SIMD because you need that to understand how we're going to do the parallel sort merge uh, quickly. Um, and then we'll talk about the, you know, the different ways to actually implement the, the, the merge phase, which is the main, sort of main part that's different in this. And then we'll have the evaluation, which was in the, the paper that, that you guys read. All right, so who, who here has, has taken 418, 618? All right, actually less than, less than uh, Less than in previous years. So here, here, here knows what SIMD is. Or who, actually, who here doesn't know what SIMD is? It's okay to raise your hand. Okay, perfect. So SIMD is a uh, stands for single instruction, multiple data. And so this is from the Flynn's taxonomy. So we'll cover SIMD in more detail uh, next week when we talk about vectorized execution. So what I'm providing you here is like the basic you need to know to understand how we're going to do the sorting quickly um, on modern hardware. But then we'll cover the, the way you apply SIMD to vectorize a bunch of other operators in, in our database system next week. Like I said, this is sort of a crash course. But the, the, the way to think about SIMD is that it's a category or a class of CPU instructions that is going to allow the, the, the CPU to perform the same operation on, on multiple data items at, at the same time, like within the same instruction. And I'll, I'll show an example of this in the, the next slide. Um, so this is not a new idea. This actually goes back, uh, again, there's this thing called Flynn's taxonomy that laid out, here's a different type of parallel architectures you can have, right? SysD be single instruction, single data. We'll see that in the next slide. And then SIMD is, is, is another example of this. You can also have MIMD or, or you know, multiple instructions on multiple data. We're focusing on a, on a single socket or single core doing this. 
So pretty much every modern uh, CPU architecture now has CMD operations. So, but it comes under a, a bunch of different names. So in x86 and from Intel, it was originally called MMX, and then now it's SSE, SSE, and then AVX is, is the modern variant of this. Right, so MMX actually doesn't stand for anything. Right? This is something that Intel made up in the, um, in the 1990s, and they explicitly say that it doesn't mean anything because right? they don't want to get sued for, you know, for, for stealing a trademark of somebody else. Um, for SSE, I think it stands for Streaming Something Instructions. I forget, I forget actually what this stands for. And PowerPC is called Altebec, and then ARM now has a thing called Neon. Again, at a high level, they, they, all, they all basically do the same thing, although the actual instructions you would use or the commands you would use are going to vary per architecture. So let's look at a really simple example here. So say we want to take two vectors, x plus y, or x and y, we want to add them together and write them out to a, a new vector z. So the way we would write this in like simple C++ code would be just a for loop, assuming that x and y are the same size, and then we're just going to iterate over every uh, index of x, add it with the same offset in, in y, and write it to, to z. Right? Pretty straightforward. So if you were to execute with, with this with SISTI, so single instruction, single data, again, you just run this for loop, and you're going to go through and just go grab two numbers, add it together, and write it out to, to your output buffer. Right? So every addition operator, uh, in, uh, in operation in our for loop is one instruction. All right. So the way to do this in SIMD, though, is that instead of actually going through and looking at every single offset one by one, we're actually going to collect a bunch of data items together, put it into a special SIMD register that's on the CPU. Right? In this case here, we're doing 12-bit SIMD registers. So we have uh, each of these are 32 bits, so we can store four 32-bit values into this register. Right? And then now, it's a single SIMD instruction to then dump out the addition operator from, from adding these two registers together. So to think about, again, think it's just adding based on offsets here. So the first offset in the top register is added with the first offset here, and that writes out to the first offset there. Right? So we just do this down the line and, uh, and for, for the other half of our input vector and produce our final output here. So now what, what, what was doing... I think we have eight items here, we was doing eight addition instructions to add these together. We're now down to two SIMD instructions. All right, so this is the basic idea of what SIMD does. It's just taking a bunch of data, putting it into these special registers, and you invoke these special instructions that then do whatever operation you want to do across registers and then write it out to a new register. Again, we'll cover this in more detail when we talk about vectorized operations, but then the, the, in order to get that data out of the SIMD registers, you have to store it back in your CPU caches, put it back in memory, and then you can, then you can do whatever else it is that you want to do it. So not all instructions can be SIMDized or vectorized like this. That's right. It's really for the special case things, or not special case things. It's really for sort of, sort of basic primitive operations, which is the kind of things we're going to care about in a database system. Right? So the, uh, the first implementations of SIMD instructions in the 90s were actually really crappy. Um, like the MMX thing from Intel, like it was, it was, the way it would work is like you couldn't do regular instructions at the same time you did SIMD instructions. That would sort of, you put some things in the SIMD registers, then you, then you do whatever is the SIMD operation you want on it, and that stopped the regular CPU from re executing regular instructions. But now in modern systems, you, you actually can do them in parallel. So that they can, in a super scalar architecture, the CPU can stage a bunch of stuff in its regular instruction pipeline, and then put a bunch of and for the instructions, execute them at the same time as executing regular instructions. Right, things have gotten way better. So, as we'll see today, and we'll see again uh, uh, next week, the, the performance gain you can get from being able to vectorize things with, with SIMD in a database system can be quite significant. Right? I got a, uh, in that case here, it was a 4x speed up, or 4x reduction in the number of addition instructions I did uh, because I was using these SIMD registers. The downside is, for as great as they are, Implementing an algorithm using these vectorized instructions is still a manual process. Right? There, there's, uh, Intel has a compiler that you can provide some hints to help it try to vectorize certain things, but for general purpose database systems, it's us, the database developers, who have to figure out how to actually do this. And not all operators can be uh, vectorized. Well, they can be vectorized, but you may not actually get the benefit uh, you'd expect because you have to stage things in registers and write them out. Right? We have to worry about data alignment issues as well. So my example back here, right? these are all 32-bit uh, integers, and I had a 128-bit 120, register, so I could stick four of them in here. If I had like 10-bit uh, values, then that's not going to work in here because 
my, the, the instruction to do this operator, to do the vectorized addition, is expecting 32-bit values. So there'll be, for the different size of the registers and the, and the different lanes, these are called, where we actually store the values, we have to make sure they're, they're aligned to what the instruction expects. Um, and then getting the data in and out, as I said, it can be tricky. And we'll see this again, uh, we'll see this later on with the, the vectorized instructions. Like, it's basically how to take a bunch of spare regions in memory and then write them out to one, one CP register, then get them out, and then you know, go in reverse and put them back in different locations. That can be expensive. All right, so again, we're not going to talk about uh, the low-level SIMD stuff today. But again, we'll see this in a second when we do the, the low-level uh, sorting networks, because that's how we're going to get this to run fast. When it, when, and everything has to fit in our CPU caches here. All right, so uh, the simple sort merge, it just has two phases. right? It's sort of like the same thing as a hash join. Right? So in the first phase, you do the sort, and you're just going to sort the, the tuples of the, of the outer relation R and the inner relation S. You're going to sort them on the join key. Now, I'm not saying what sorting algorithm we're using here. Again, a high level, it doesn't matter. It can be quick sort, it can be heap sort, it can be bubble sort if you're, if you're crazy, right? It doesn't matter. We just have to get everything in, our, in, in, the, in the sorted order based on the join key. Then in the merge phase, we just have two iterators that, that are going to walk through the two relations and just do comparisons across as, as, you, as you step along to see whether you have a match. And the idea by pre-sorting it, you avoid the problem of having to do a complete scan over the data for every single uh, for every single tuple, as you normally have to do in a nested loop join. So the visually it looks like this. Again, we have our inner relation uh, and our outer relation. They're both going to sort. They're, 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 they're you know on the join key, and I'm not saying what the algorithm is. It doesn't matter. Um, and then in the merge phase, again, we just have this iterator, and you just scan, scan down in lockstep, and just do our comparisons. Right? So that's all sort merge is. Now, where things are going to get confusing is that we're going to, what we're going to talk about today is that we're going to use merge sort to do our sort merge join. Okay? So I'll try to make very, be very careful to talk about when I say a merge, do I mean the merge phase of the merge sort or the merge phase of the, the sort merge? Okay? It's, it is what it is, but we'll do the best we can. Okay, so what's the most extensive part here? Should be obvious, right? Sorting, right? Like, the merge is easy, right? Because it's, it's, just, it's just a sequential scan, and again, depending whether I have foreign keys or not, I may have to backtrack, but in general, you don't have to, right? So the sorting is what we want to speed up. So that, for, to do this, we want to figure out a way to parallelize it, right? Um, and, there's, and this is going to boil down to making sure we design the database system in such a way that it's using the hardware, meaning the CPU and memory, correctly or in the most efficient manner. Right? And so in general, this means that we're going to try to parallelize the, the process as much as possible using all the cores that are available to us. Right? Uh, we to be aware of our, of our NUMA boundaries so that we try to reduce the amount of, of you know, Cross interconnect traffic of, of one core or on one socket reading data from another socket. We're going to try to only operate on uh, on localized data. And then the reason why I talked about SIMD in the beginning is that in order to get the speed up, the actual processing we're doing at a, at a single core, we want to use SIMD instructions as, as much as possible. So we'll see in the case of uh, Hyper and, and their sort merge algorithm. Um, they're going to violate this last one because when they do the uh, in the merge phase, they're just going to be doing sequential reads and therefore uh, in, in, in sequential reads on local data, and therefore they're going to claim that the hardware prefetcher is going to hide the mask the latencies of of, of doing these reads, and therefore SIMD is not going to help us, right? But they, when when you look at the ETH paper results that you guys read, they, they lose, right? So I. If you're doing sorting, I think all of these make sense. All of these, all of these are, are good things. The other thing they say also too is like, again, we're talking about how to do parallel sorting in the context of a sort merge uh, join, but this still we still need sorting anyway to do order buys. So all the things we'll talk about at least in the in in the sorting phase and the partitioning phase in the parallel version uh, of sort merge join, we still can use for order buy. Just whether you merge or not depends on whether you need it for the join. So 
Now in the parallel version, it's just like in the hash join, that we're going to introduce a new optional first phase where we do partitioning, right? And this is just splitting up our relations, assigning them to, uh, to different workers, and then that way they operate them on, on, in parallel. And the question is, I mean, where do they actually write out their data? Do they write it locally or write it globally? All the same issues we talked about last time with, with hash join still apply here. And then everything else is still the same. We still sort, sort based on the join key, and then we're going to merge them together. And again, how, the, uh, how we sort of set things up in the previous phases will, will determine how we're going to do the merge. Like, are, are they going to be reading data on its local core? Are they reading data from, a, from another core? Right? Sort of how we describe these parts here will determine what we do here. All right, so for partitioning phase, there's not really much we, we can say more than we talked about last time. Right? The only thing I would sort of add, which is, I should have said this for the hash joining stuff as well, but there's this notion of a ex implicit partitioning versus uh, explicit partitioning. So implicit partitioning is when the, the data got loaded into the database, it could have already partitioned it ahead of time in such a way that was uh, ideal for the join key we, we want to use for our query. So let's say if I knew what, if I, if I knew for these two tables I want to load in, I knew ahead of time what key I was going to join them on, then as I load the data, I can make sure I partition it based on that join key, right? Whether it's range partitioning or hash partitioning, it doesn't matter. So now when it comes time to do my, my join algorithm, I'm already been split up nicely based on the join key, so therefore I only need to have, I know where the data is being located, and I make sure that, that this, uh, you know, this block of data that corresponds to this join key range only looks at this other block for the matching range. Right? But again, this requires you to have the join key ahead of time. So, so in theory, we can do this, but this, always, this almost never actually plays out in practice. Because people always want to do joins on, on weird things or it's things that were unexpected. The, the algorithm, the radix join we talked about before, or the range partitioning stuff we'll talk about today, these are examples of explicit partitioning. So the data is just sort of stored in whatever way it wants. And then when our query shows up, we're then going to, on the fly, generate partitions that are, 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 that are ideal for our one query at that moment in time. Then we, we, we after we do the, the, the join, then we just throw it away, and then the next query comes along, we'll do the same thing over again. So in theory, if you see the same join query over and over again, the same join key, you could then sort of reorganize your data to, to essentially have, have this, right? And that way you're not doing it on a per query basis. Um, in practice, though, for really large data sets, that actually comes quite hard. And like I said, for arbitrary queries, it's impossible to do. Right? You typically see uh, this mostly ha happens in uh, like OHP workloads, because the queries are the same thing over and over again. And there's sort of this nice natural hierarchy of how the, the, the schema is laid out. This is what we worried about here. And again, it can be the radix partition we talked about last class, or it can be the range stuff we'll talk about today. All right. so. As I said, the most important thing we have we have to worry about and to do sort merge is sort merge join is the sorting phase. So when we talked about this in the, the for a disk based system, the bottleneck wasn't sorting, right? Bottleneck was writing read, writing data in and out from 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 disk into memory. So we talked about it, we in that class we talked about external merge sort where the idea was breaking things up into chunks and making sure we stage that we operate on chunks or one block at a time in memory, and then when we're done, we write it back out and bring in the next block. Right? So when we brought a block into memory, the join algorithm, or sorry, the sorting algorithm didn't actually matter. Quick sort was good enough. But now everything's in memory. Quick sort is actually not going to be good enough. We actually want to be smarter and do something better. Right? Because we need to be aware of where our, our data is actually being stored and what our architecture looks like. The quick sort, the sort of the, the textbook definition of it, has no notion of locality or, 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 or data, data's physical location. It just swaps things wh wherever it needs. Right? And that means it could be reading across new, new boundaries. So we want to pick a sorting algorithm that's aware of where data is being stored and actually the size of the data. So we know at what sort of CPU cache we can operate in, and that'll change what algorithm we want to use to do the sorting. All right. So what's going to happen is we're going to do this in sort of stages or levels. And at each level, we're going to generate what are called runs, or sorted run. 
And this is just going to be some segment of the table we want to we do our join on that is in sorted order locally. So what I mean by that is, say I have four tuples. I, so, so say my table has 1,000 tuples. I can grab four of them, and I can sort just those four. And that'll be, that, that's my run. So globally, it's not sorted. But within the, just the, the local thing that I looked at, that's being sorted. So the idea is that we're going to build up the size of these sorted runs incrementally until we generate the, the total global, globally sorted run for the entire table. So again, the way we're going to do this is being aware of how big our runs are and then using a different method or a different algorithm that'll fit in the sort of the, the storage level we're at so we can do that as fast as possible. And then once we exceed that size, then we go to a next level and choose a different algorithm that's optimized for that storage level. So at the very top, in level one, uh, we're going to try to do in-register sorting because CPU registers are the fastest thing. Right? It's the fastest memory we can access to, get access to, but we can't store that much. So we're going to operate on that. Then once we exceed the, the capacity of our CPU registers for, for our sorted runs, then we go to level two, and now we're going to do in-cache sorting. And this is a technique where uh, it, it's using techniques from the first one, but now it's looking at larger things and again being mindful of where our cache boundaries are. Then once we exceed our CPU caches, all bets are off, and we just use a sort of add a cache sorting technique. Um, and the approach I'm going to show you is actually from an Intel paper where it seems like it's going to be a bad thing to do or slow uh, because they're going to execute more instructions. But because they're sort of staging the, the, the sorting operations you're doing in, in a clever way, you avoid stalls because things you're operating on are, are not in, in your CPU caches. So all this comes from a paper, again, written by Intel uh, in 2009. This is that, remember I showed this sort of six papers uh, in that table before, and I said it sort of started with this Intel Oracle paper, and then it led to Hyper, and then it led to, to the, the paper you guys read from the, from the Germans. Um, this, is the, this is that paper, and basically it says, here's how to do uh, hash joins really fast on modern hardware. But if you had larger SIMD registers, in the way we can assume here, because we have them now, then this is how this is, this is how to do the sort merge very efficient. So I'll say also too, I'm not going to use the exact terminology that they use in this paper. Like this term of level, this is this is something I came up with because I think they call it either phases or stages, and that overlaps with the phases we're talking about for our join algorithm. So for simplicity, we're we're just going to call it levels. All right. So. Again, the high level looks like this. This is called cache conscious sorting. It's again, cache conscious means we're aware of the, 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 what level of the cache in our CPU that we're operating on. Therefore, we know how much space we actually have. So at the very beginning, our table's unsorted. And then in level one, we're going to do the in register sorting. And this is going to generate sorted runs of four elements. And then once we get larger than that, then we go to level two. And now we're going to start combining together these smaller sorted runs into larger sorted runs. And then when we see that, then we get down here and generate a, uh, a even bigger sorted run until we generate the final globally sorted one, right? But again, th this is the highlight we're going to go, and we're going to go through uh, each of these steps one by one. We're going to focus on the first one uh, because I think this is the, this is the easiest one to understand. But then we can build on top of that and do more complicated things. All right. So in the first level, they're going to use a technique that's actually really old, like 1940s old. Um, called sorting networks. And the, the, the basic idea of what it was back then is that they wanted to build sort of specialized hardware that could sort, uh, you know, sort data sets, meaning like it was um, like, like literally like wires to take data in on the wire and then have it do swaps and then generate sorted output, right? So the way it's going to work is you're going to take your input and the input you know, the inputs can be attached to a, a wire, and that sort of carries along the value on that wire. So at this point here, from the nine, along this wire, the value is nine, five, three, six. Right? And then what will happen is they'll have these stages here where you're going to do a, uh, basically a min-max. And whatever the min value is, that's going to go on the top wire, and the max value is going to go on the bottom wire here. So I'm going to have nine, five. And what will happen is I'll do min goes on 5 here, max goes 9 there. And then now that's the new value coming along that wire after that comparison. All right, is, this, is this clear? All right, same thing down here, 3, 6. And then I keep doing this going along, 
Uh, in this case here, the three doesn't need any more comparison. That produces our final output. These guys it keeps going along, and then I produce my my final sort of value, right? And what's really cool about this is that no matter what input values I have here, I'm always going to be doing the exact same comparisons. Meaning, like I, again, I can bake this in hardware with wires in the '40s. Uh, and have this always, you know, take whatever input in and then produce the, 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 the whatever the min-max value is. And I'm always going to generate for the same sort of wire configuration, is always going to generate a, a, a correctly sorted uh, input sequence or output sequence. All right? So let me take a guess what the advantage of this is for modern CPUs. Exactly, no branch prediction. Think about how quick source is implemented. If this is less than this, then maybe write it here, otherwise write it that, right? So I can write this without SIMD, just really simple like this. So I can just take uh, my input sequence as an array and then just do three stages where I'm just doing min and max and writing out uh, whatever the, the output of this, you know, this comparison is, or not even comparison, this min va va function is, and just write that to my output there. Right? As he said, there's no branches. There's no branch from his prediction. Right? I'm going to execute the exact same code every single time. Yes? You can also parallelize all of these comparisons, right? So he says you can parallelize all of these comparisons. Yes. SIMD. Next slide. OK. So let's see how to do sorting networks with SIMD. As he said, to parallelize it or vectorize it is the term I would use. So, so as I said, for this one, we're going to, we're going to operate on um, uh, four values in our register, right? Because the I'm only showing the keys here. When we do joins in a real database system, I need to store the, I need to store the join key and the pointer to the tuple. Because otherwise, if I just sort these values, I don't know what the hell the, the tuple it belonged to, right? So I'm not showing this here, but implicitly, it's the join key plus the, uh, plus, plus the, 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 the pointer. So now, if you assume the pointer is 64 bits, and then you assume that the value will be also 64 bits, that means the, the value here is actually 128 bits. So that's why in that Intel paper, it's again from 2009, they said that you can't do sort merge in modern systems because at that time they didn't have 512-bit registers. Right? If you have 512-bit SIMD registers, you can store four 128-bit values. We can do that now as of 2017. Back then you couldn't do that. So again, I'm not showing you the, the pointers here. Just assume that you're, they're implicitly stored. And then you know how to not, when you do the comparison, you're, you're just comparing the value portion of the join key, not the actual pointer. All right? All right, so to vectorize this, we're going to do, actually do, uh, f generate four sort of runs all at the same time. And this is because the SIMD operations, the SIMD instructions, can't do comparisons within the same register. It does it across registers. Right? So I'm not going to say 998. Nine, Six, seven. I'm not going to sort these guys. Well, I'm. I will end up these these guys sorted, but I'm going to. I need to flip it around so that I'm storing them almost as like a column store, right? So the, f the first thing I have to do is, is load the, the data into our registers. So again, this could either be a contiguous write or or you know of, of a chunk of memory and write it in, or it could be a bunch of uh, uh, a single loads, right? In practice, you want to do one you know per register because that's faster. All right, so there's now to sort across registers, right? And like this, we're going to do a transformation. We're going to flip things around, and then now uh, within this, we just do the the same ten min and max instructions we did in the in the last slide, and then that'll generate uh, things in our sort of order, and then we transpose it to put it back in the correct correct order like that. So again, even though my register started out nine eight six seven, I don't care whether that's actually going to be sorted for this. I just want to have one run that's sorted. Does that make sense? Again, because all I care about is that, that within the local run itself, that's sorted. So think about this. I went from, uh, I went from um, you know, doing quick sort, be way more instructions. It may have way more cycles because I have branch mispredictions. But now I have a deterministic algorithm I can execute in, 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 in a vectorized fashion to sort uh, 16 values with just, uh, you know, with 20 instructions, 24, 24, 25 instructions. That's crazy. That's awesome. 
right? So, at the, again, in the first level, we're, we're generating sorted runs of, of four elements, and we're gonna do this for everything. But now, of course, obviously we want things to be in the globally sorted order, so now we want to then pass these sorted runs to level two and let it do a sort of a larger sorted run by combining together these smaller chunks of smart, smaller runs, right? And some, well, shuffle and store. So four load, 20 min max, so we're 24, 20, 28 with the store, so 36. So 36 instructions to execute all these. That's really good. All right, so in the next, next level, um, we're going to use what is called a Bitonic merge network. So this is going to look a lot like this, the, the, the sorting network from the last, last, the last level, but instead of sorting things within a single CPU register, we're going to sort things that are much larger. Now we can still use SIMD, it's just we're going to have to do much extra work to, to move things around and to put it in the right order that we need to then be able to process in our, in, in, with, with vectorized instructions. Right? And so for this, the key thing we have to be careful about is because we want to make sure everything fits in our CPU caches, L3, that we can only sort runs or generate runs that are half the size of our available cache. Because we, we need one half to, for input and then the second half for our, for our output. So again, this is from a paper that came before the, the 2009 paper from Intel on their sort merge join algorithm. Um, it's called Efficient Implementation of Sorting of Multi-Core. So this is another paper from Intel in a, in a major database conference where they just show how to do sorting really fast in, with vectors, vector, uh, with, with SIMD. And then they're reporting a 3.5x speed up over the SIMD uh, implementation of this. So this is like crazy when you think about this, right? This is, this is like, think how old quicksort is. And from an asymptotic analysis, it's not anything faster, but actually in real hardware, in constant terms, we're getting 3.5x speed up over what quicksort could do, right? That's amazing for a sort of core fundamental algorithm that we use all the time in computer science to get that kind of speed up. It doesn't come around, come around very often, right? Uh, Intel actually writes very good papers. Um, again, when you think about it, Intel's not in the business of selling, you know, uh, you know, they're not in the business of selling a database, they're in the business of selling hardware. And in order for Intel to stay competitive, is that they always put out new features in their hardware, like SIMD, as, as one example. Uh, but the problem is, if nobody knows how to program these new features, then Intel's not gonna sell more hardware. So Intel writes actually some really good papers that are easy to read and follow, that say, hey, look, Intel just added this new feature, here's how to use it in, in databases, here's, here's how to use it in Bitcoin mining or whatever, right? And they put out a lot, a lot of good open source libraries for, that take advantage of Intel uh, hardware. So I, 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 I like their work, I like their papers, and this, this is one good example of this. So, uh, I'm not going to go through, again, the details of all the different steps as we did in the sorting network, but this is a high-level uh, visualization of what a Bitonic merge network looks like. So, in this case here, we're going to sort two, uh, you know, four element runs that we would generate from level one. So, in the first order run, that's going to be just in the order that, the, that comes out of the algorithm. But in the second one, we're actually put, we have to put it in reverse order, because the way we sort of stage things out with our min and maxes going along is that you have to have this inverse order so that the, the last element is the smallest one for this one, and the last element is the biggest one for the top sort of run. And then you do some swapping, and then shuffle allows you to move things around. Again, keeping everything on the, in the SIMD registers without bringing it back to the CPU caches. And you just do this in three stages, and then you end up out with your, with your sorted run for all the values here. Again, it's exactly the same thing we did before. We're just, now we're just, we're having more stages because we're looking at larger runs. And you can keep expanding the size of this run until you fill up your, your CPU cache, or you, you have the size of your CPU cache. All right? So, now at this point, once we exceed half the size of our L3 cache, now we fall down to level three. And now we're gonna do what's called a multi-way merging. So the basic idea here is that the, we're gonna break up the, the, the merging process of our sorted runs into uh, these sort of tasks that we then farm out across a bunch of different threads or, or, uh, or cores. And what'll happen is we do some internal bookkeeping to keep track of whether the, uh, whether we, we, we think the data that this, this task is gonna operate on is in our CPU cache. And then when we think it's ready, then we can schedule a thread to then do the actual merge process. 
and we sort of stage this out until we get larger and larger, um, larger and larger sort of runs. So again, this is going to require more bookkeeping on our part inside the database system. Uh, but the advantage is that we're going to pay off extra instructions in exchange for having fewer cache misses and, and memory stalls. So it's sort of like a careful orchestration of, of what the CPU is actually doing in order to have every, uh, every time we execute something, all the, all the data that instructions, those instructions need are available in CPU caches. Now, this sounds amazing, right? Well, I'll show a simple visualization of it, but like this sounds like, of course, this is exactly what you want to do. I feel like this is really hard. Um, I don't think anybody actually implements this. And the, the challenge also is that this assumes that the data system has exclusive access to the hardware. And therefore, you can kind of, you know, prefetch things from your CPU caches. And, and when, you, when you schedule a task to go get, 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 you know, get executed, that it's guaranteed to be there. I feel like when I read this paper, like it's a nice thing to do, but like I, I feel like this would be hard to implement um, in a real system with, with a lot of things going on at the same time. But that's fine. All right, so it looks like this. So these are all our sorted runs from L, L2. And we have these little merge operators. And so these merge operators get put into these task queues. And the idea is that there's some background process that's keeping track of what are the data I'm processing on in, in a task queue. Uh, and let me go ahead and try to prefetch this into my CPU cache so that when it's ready, when somebody actually then operates on this, this task, it's available for it. Right? So the idea is that, say, this thing here uh, is, is this piece of memory that it needs to merge is not in my CPU cache. I don't want to execute this thing yet. I want to wait. And then once it's in my CPU cache, then I go ahead and, and, and schedule something. So basically, the, the, the thread is, is jumping around and executing all these different merges in these different spaces, which seems like, again, a bad idea because you have it's not a context switch because you're still in the same thread, but you're at least jumping the execution context all over the map. Um, and there's the you know, extra work you have to do to figure out how to, how to schedule it. But the idea is that this trade-off of, of extra instructions in exchange for better, uh, better cache locality. So is it, again, I'm sort of being very vague here, but this is the, the, the basic idea of this, that they're just doing the, they're just merging things together, right, in almost those two nested for loops, um, or you know, two iterators to say, is this thing less than this thing, merge it together. But as each, these, these, sort of these, these runs, as they get near the front of the queue, we go ahead and make sure we prefetch them. Right? I'm seeing blank faces. Is, is this sort of clear? OK. All right, so this gets us to sorting. Again, the, we could just do a quick sort. In this example here, we're doing uh, merge sort, because that, that is something you can actually take advantage of SIMD. All right, so now we have entered the, the merge phase, because now we have a bunch of data that's been uh, sorted. And again, we just want to iterate over them now and, and merge them together to produce our, our join output. So we can do this in parallel. Um, if we sort of organize the data in the previous step in such a way that the, the well, actually, no, sorry. We can do this in parallel because this is essentially a read-only operation. Because during the merge phase, we're, not, we're only generating output, right? And that, that we need to possibly synchronize, depending on, on whether we write to one buffer or it's partitioned. But during the, 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 the actual merge process itself, during the join, they don't, they don't write anything. They're not modifying because we've already sorted everything. So there's nothing we need to do a, as we're doing this. Right? And as we already said, depending if there's duplicates and depending whether they're doing a left outer join or not, we may have to backtrack. But for our purposes here, we're not going to worry about this. So. The, there's going to be three ways we're going to do our, our, our sort merge. So, so there's the multi-way and the multi-pass sort merge from the ETH paper you guys read. And then there's the massively parallel sort merge from the, the, the hyper guys, which I think the paper covers as well. They, 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 they at least benchmark it. I don't know if they describe it in detail. So we're going to go through these, each, these, each of these one by one. Um, but the, the, the spoilers, again, that the, the, the hyper guys say, this is the way to do joins. Don't worry about hash joins. Do sort merge. Here's how to do it very quickly. That was 2012. 2013, they came back and said this is a bad idea. And then the ETH paper you guys read basically shows this thing gets crushed. It's, it's not even close. So I don't know why they were, they were so gung-ho about it before, but that's fine. Okay. 
So the first one is we need the multi-wage sort merge, and this is this is the best approach, right? So it's basically everything we've already talked about so far, right? It's, it's doing the cash con conscious sorting with the three levels. And again, there, it's not a full system; it's just a little test bed system. So, so the interference during the third level of different threads getting scheduled at different times, they're not worrying about that because they're running, you know, they're running by on the machine by itself, right? Um, so the for the outer table, what we're going to do is that we're going to have each core is going to sort all the data they have in their local partition with the, the, the sorting networks at level one, the botanic networks in, in, in level two. Then they do the multi-way merge sort. And the inner table is going to do the exact same thing. So now what you're going to have is that the, at, at, for each partition on the inner table and the outer table, everything is localized and, and sorted together. So now I need to only operate on the data that's, that, that's within, my, within my partition, right? And you can do this all within, within a single core because, again, all the data that could ever possibly be to use to join are located together. So let's look at a visualization of this. So the first stage, I, we're assuming that we have, we're doing explicit partitioning. So we can do the same thing we did with Hyper, or just sort of split up our, our data into chunks or blocks or morsels, whatever you want to call them. And then every core now is going to generate a, a locally sorted uh, uh, you know, segment, a run, if you will. Yeah, it's a run. A run for the data that, at it, its core. And then now we want to do a multi-way merge. So for this, we're going to have all the cores write out the data within some range to a, a buffer uh, a memory space at one core. So this is, this is doing range partitioning. So I'm going to say, I know what the distribution of values are because I've already gone down a path and sorted it. So now you're going to divide it up into to, uh, equal size chunks or ranges and say, all right, within this range, it, it goes here. And then for the next range, uh, it, go, it goes to the next one. And then within this, we're gonna do that, this is how we do that multi-way merge sort. So again, we'll do this for everyone here. All right? So again, now within a single core, we have a globally sorted run. All right? Now, on the outer table, sorry, the, the inner table, if we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to say just the word sort, right? because I've run out of space. But it's all of this. So it's doing the, the redistribution. Uh, sorry, it does, it does the local sort, sort, level one, level two, then does the redistribution to write the data within one core, within a range, and then you do the multi-way multi -way merge sort to, to combine it together to, 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 to now this thing is globally sorted. So again, now when I want to do my, my join, it's just local, right? The data at this partition or this core only needs to look at data at this one. It doesn't need to talk to anybody else. Right? And I just rip through it in, in parallel. So again, there's a bunch of communication we did before because we had to, sh to shuffle things around to, to, to in that range partitioning phase. But once we're there, this all happens. Right? It's not going to happen in our CPU cache because this, this chunk is actually quite big. Right? It, may, it may not fit in our CPU caches. But all the, there's no coordination across the different cores. I just operate on the data that, that, that's local to me. So the only part I need to synchronize is, th is this part here. I need to wait for everyone to be done the sorting, then you figure out what the ranges are, and then everyone blasts them out and sends them out to everyone else. Right? Um, so essentially, another way to think about this is that we're only paying the penalty to do a remote write or read once. This phase here, everything else is all just local. Right? And again, the spoiler, this actually turns out to be the best. Multi-pass merge is, is just like the multi-way sort merge. Sorry, the multi-pass sort merge is like the multi-way sort merge, uh, except that you're not going to do that redistribution part. Right? So you, you'll do the local sort, level one, level two, but then it's, every single core now is, is just going to have its locally sorted data, and then they're just going to compare across the entire table on the other side of the join. So this one here, you're not you're not doing the the, the random uh, remote writes in the same way that the multi pass or the multi way one does, but you're gonna do more remote reads when you actually do the merge phase of the join, right? So it looks like this. So again, we're gonna do the exact same thing on the both sides, right? So we're gonna do, again do our local sort, uh, but now we're now we're just gonna do a global merge 
on this. So for every single thread on, on every core, it's going to do iteration over its local data. And it knows about, I have a bunch of these sorted runs on my other side, on my inner table. So it needs to look at, do a scan on every single one to try to find the match. So this is doing remote reads because these, you know, these cores could be on different NUMA, NUMA regions. So the argument you can make, and the hyper guys sort of make this, is that I'm doing sequential scans here, right? I'm scanning through these regions of memory just from, from top to bottom. And obviously, depending on what I'm joining on, I, I, you know, I can truncate and say, I, I've, I've, read far, I've read far enough, I can just stop. But it's a lot of sequential reads. So the hyper guys are going to claim that the Harvard prefetcher is going to speed this up and, and mask the latency of having to go over a different NUMA region because it's going to, it's going to guesstimate that I'm going to need a bunch of data after I read a bunch of, uh, another segment of it. So go ahead and bring that over for me. Does everyone know what Harvard prefetching is? Right, this is something that, that, that like, like the low-level hardware actually does. We'll see next class or next week, there's actually software prefetching. You, you can provide hints to the hardware and say, prefetch this for me. But in this case here, we're just letting the hardware figure it out for us. It doesn't always get it right, though. All right, so this is clear. So the multi-way does the uh, redistribution so that you have sort globally sorted runs. at it. Uh, you have locally sorted runs at each core, but all the data you need is only at your core. In this one here, you're, doing, you're not doing that redistribution, so you have to do the global merge. The last approach is the massively parallel sort merge from Hyper. So they're going to do something different than, than the other two. So in the outer table, they're going to do range partitioning um, on, on the outer table. And then they're going to sort it so that you have a globally sorted outer table. And then you, but you don't do the same thing for the inner table. right? You just do a local sort, sort at each core in the inner table. And then now when you do the merge phase, right? it's going to be merging the sorted run of the outer table and a segment of the inner table that you know you actually only need to care about because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's locally sorted. So let's look at visualization. Again, on the outer table side, we're going to do uh, partitioning ahead of time. So this is not sorting, right? This is just saying, uh, like, this could be the radius partition we had before, right? We're just taking a bunch of data. Actually, I think it has to be, it has to be range partitioning. Yeah, if, you do, if you do radix, the things get jumbled. Actually, I don't know what they do. I forget. It doesn't matter. So somehow we're chunking things up. So data that's close to each other is, is all within the same core. Right? Actually, it is range partitioning because you want, you want to be globally sorted. right? So this whole thing now is globally sorted. And then each partition or each core only has you know, a chunk of that globally sorted range. Now on the, uh, on the inner table, we're going to sort, but only sort locally. The, so this could just be the level one, level two level three as well, or quick sort, it doesn't matter. But we're not trying to redistribute everything so this is all globally sorted. So now, when we do our join, the idea is that for this, for any, any sort of run in the outer table, we'll scan the whole thing, but then we only scan a subset of what's in the, uh, the sorted local run for each core. So I'll do you know, the same thing, I'll have to look a little bit of data for each, each partition, but I'm not scanning the whole thing the way I had to do in the multi-pass. Right? Again, same thing for the next one. You just do, this, do the same kind of scan going down and so forth. Right, is this clear? Right? So again, this, this, is, this, is, this is not the sorting algorithm. This is, this is how we're going to organize the data as it's being produced in sort of the sorting phase. Then that determines what kind of uh, implementation or algorithm we'll use to do the merge. So the hybrid guys came up with a bunch of rules as well uh, in their paper that said, you know, if you're going to do parallelized execution for for sort merge, here's some general rules that that, that are useful. Um, and I think again, even though we don't want to do sort merge, I think these are still uh, even beyond databases. These are still good rules to live by. Right. So the first thing it claims is that you don't never do any uh, random write to, to non-local memory. So again, they were only doing uh, all the writes they were doing always at, the, at that, their local partition, right? Uh, the, I mean, the, the partitioning sort of counts as, as a random write, but actually now as you're doing the, 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 the joint algorithm itself, you don't have any random writes. 
If you ever have to do a read on non-local memory, make sure that's always doing sequential reads, or sequential scans, because that allows the hardware prefetcher to hide the, ma the massive latencies of, of reading remote data. And then you want to avoid any synchronization primitives that require any core to, to wait for another to finish before it can proceed. And again, the, this is sort of obvious, but like once everything's been sorted, then the whole operation is read-only, so we don't have to do any synchronization across all you know across the different cores. All right? All right, so let's get to the evaluation that, that was from the, uh, the the from the ETH guys in the paper you read. So for this one, they're gonna compare uh, both the sort merge and the three different implementations that we talked about so far, as well as that the radix based hash join that we talked about last class. Right? I think they may call it a radix join, right? But but it's radix partitioning for a hash join. They're going to run on way beef, a much beefier machine than we talked about last class. So now they're running on a four socket uh, Intel Xeon processor with uh, eight cores of hyper threads. So, uh, so 64 total threads. And they're running on half a terabyte of, of DRAM. So everything's always going to fit. So the first experiment they did was just compare the speed of the SIMD sort, the level one, level two, level three stuff we talked about before, with the, the sort of C++ standard template library sort. Well, it uses what's called a hybrid sort. So they do, they do uh, quick sort in the beginning, and then once the data gets a little bit uh, sorted, they have, they have enough sorted runs, then they switch over and do heap sort, right? So this is just along the x-axis, they're scaling up the number of tuples that they want to sort, and then the y-axis is just the, the number of tuples per second they're processing. So this is nice, because this is showing that you're getting roughly about, uh, about a 3x speed up improvement for the SIMD sort in the best case scenario, which actually corroborates the, the Intel paper's findings from, from 2008. Right, so this is another good example of reproducing work done by other people and showing that the, the science actually add, you know, matches up. Right, so this is good. We, this shows that, again, SIMD sort is, is clearly ideal. This is something that we, we'd want to do. So now we want to get into the, actual, the, the sorting itself. So this part's confusing. So there's the partition phase, the sorting phase, and then there's the they're doing a breakdown between the uh, the merge of the sorting phase and then the merge of the join phase. So S merge and M join. That's that's what those are. So the the main takeaway here is that other than Hyper's approach is actually the worst, um, is again the multi-way one. Even though it's doing more work, like it seems like to to do that redistribution would slow us down. But because we get better cache locality when we actually do the merge phase. Right? That's why they're getting the best performance here. Right? Another way to plot this is that you know, along this axis in the bar charts, we're measuring cycles, uh, the number of CPU cycles per output tuple. But we also just measure it in terms of throughput and a line graph like here. And as expected, right, as you, um, actually, what is that saying? Sorry. Yeah. As you execute fewer instructions, you get higher throughput. Right? So we're doing less work to execute this, ex to operate on the same amount of data. So that's why this one gets better throughput and ex executing lower cycles. Again, this is expected because, again, we're executing more instructions, but the instructions we do execute take fewer cycles. That's the sort of way to read that. Um, all right, for the next graph, they want to compare the, the, the multi-way join versus the, the, the hyper join, just sort of get a better understanding of what's actually going wrong uh, in, in the hyper approach. So for here, as we're doubling the number of threads, we want to see double the throughput. That's called linear scaling. That's the ideal thing we want to have in a, in a parallel database system. So you see roughly is that when we're at 16 hardware threads, real threads, we're doing 130 uh, uh, million tuples per second. Um, and then when we double the 32 threads, we're roughly almost you know, 260, so almost exactly double. That's nice. Obviously, when you get to hyper-threading, things fall off because these aren't real cores and you have cache contention and, and, and other issues. In the case of hyper, and once you get to these larger counts, uh, they're not scaling. And I, I think the reason, if I remember correctly, was the, just the, the, the overhead of reading data across different NUMA regions, that just made everything slower. So as you increase the number of threads, you increase the, the likelihood that the data you need is on another NUMA region, so therefore they get slower performance. And they, the paper talks about how like the, the, you know, the, the claim that the Harvard prefetcher was going to save us didn't actually turn out. To be correct at all. All right. All right. Uh, this one now they're comparing the the radix hash join versus the 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 sort merge join. 
um, for the multi-way sort merge. And I don't, again, last class I said like, you know, nobody actually does the partitioning stuff. And here all these gray bars are the partitioning stuff. And this sort of shows you like, I don't have, num I don't have numbers to say if you didn't do the hash partitioning, you know, how much lower would it actually be? But in this case here, they're, they're, they're partitioning 1.6 billion tuples. Um, you know, you're, you're paying a lot of overhead to do that in terms of the total cost of doing the join. So this just shows you that the hash join is always faster. I think the non radix version of this would be even better. So every data system, every major data system will, will still support both these algorithms, but nine times out of 10, or even probably even higher probability, it'll always want to do the hash join. So this is like the best version of what the sort merge join could do will still lose to what I consider to be an inferior hash join. All right, and the last one uh, is again the same experiment here. They're just showing you how the performance uh, falls out or goes down for the radix hash join as you increase the, the number of tuples. Um, the sort merge join would never do better. And again, the was curious about this is that the, the no matter how big the number of tuples are we're, we're running, we're always basically doing the same amount of work, right? Um, and just getting the overhead of doing that sorting stuff is, is, is quite a lot, whereas the, the hashing part um, can be quite efficient. So I'd say as you're going down here, the, the bottleneck is really the, the, the partitioning phase because there's a bunch of extra writes. All right, so any questions about this? I realize the room's like <laughs> And he's falling asleep. <laughs> yes? So do these sort merges really only work if you're dealing with integers? His question is, do these sort merge these sort merges only work if you're doing integers. Primitive types, fixed length. So to do this on a very length thing, you're, you're screwed. And this is why, like, again, we should have talked about this, but like, you, if, you're sorting, if you're sorting strings that are uncompressed, it may make sense to just do a pass on them and do dictionary compression, because then you can, you can take advantage of all these things. Or the, the, the more common case would be, like, my, my inner table and outer table are compressed from different, different dictionaries, so I decompress one, then recompress it versus the outer table's dictionary, and then now I can do all, all of this. So sim, there's no SIMD instructions to work on variable length data, because you can't. If you're char, if you're, if you're, if you're a fixed length string and it fits in the SIMD, then you can do this. But if, if not, you're, you have to re-encode it. OK, so again, both of these approaches you need to have because there may be some cases where the, the sort merge actually might be better, especially again, if you have a, if you're doing a join on a join key and then the order by clause is on that join key, instead of having to do the join and then sort, you just do the sort merge and then it comes out to be already sorted and you don't have to do anything extra for the order by. So that's why some you know, database systems keep around both of these algorithms, right? Um, but again, getting a good hash join would be is, is the most important thing. Like if you're building a data system from scratch, the first thing you should implement if you want to do joins is a hash join. If you want to do OLAP. For, for OLTP, you do nested loop index joins. Okay? All right. What is the current temperature in here? It went up. Okay. It was, 70, it was 77. Or it's 78. went down to 77. Now it's back up. Um, all right. So let's stop here. On Wednesday, we're new query compilation. So this lecture will explain why Amadou's, Tanuj, uh, Katia, and, and Wen, why their project is <laughs> So, you're, so we'll, we'll, we'll teach you what query compilation is, and then we'll show you the mistakes that we did in the old system, Peloton, and, we'll, and this will sort of explain why what they're doing is the right way to go forward. And I think it's pretty much us and MemSQL are the only ones that are doing it the way we're doing now, as far as I know, okay? All right, guys, uh, let's get out of here. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I'll guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.